One question that uh, I think we oftentimes uh, kind of don't think too much about is the question, why do we need finance? Like we all do finance, but we kind of don't take this uh, step back and don't ask ourselves the question why finance is actually important. So this paper to some extent is trying to deal with this question, why potentially finance can actually matter and what we can learn uh, from uh, financial decisions about a broader macroeconomic uh, environment. So, so one of the points that is being raised oftentimes when we talk about the role of finance is that the uh, financial sector or capital markets more specifically are actually potentially good about uh, allocation of capital into the most productive uses. But uh, it's kind of uh, theoretically appealing and we know that potentially that could matter, but at the same time, it's not obvious whether this function is actually performed uh, in an efficient way as we think about. So, so the goal of this paper is kind of think about this question from the perspective of investments. And if you think about it uh, kind of uh, traditionally, when we think about who these investors are, who are going to perform this role of uh, efficient capital allocators, Usually we think about local markets where you have domestic investors who are supposed to screen investments and make these best possible decisions. But to some extent, one of the big phenomena we had in the financial markets was the rise of globalization. So what we basically observed over the last uh, a couple of decades, and especially so in the last uh, 10 years or so, is the real rise in foreign uh, investment participation in financial markets. So, so in some sense, if you want to put some uh, numbers uh, on this uh, point, uh, you can see, for example, that uh, in the United States, the average uh, foreign ownership of uh, US stock uh, has gone from about 2% in 2000 to about 10% uh, in 2013. More striking so actually if you go outside the US and if you look at the holdings of non-US stocks outside the US by the foreign investors, you see that that number has actually quadrupled. So it went from something like 5% to about 20%. So clearly what is a plausible hypothesis or a plausible question to ask is to what extent is this race in globalization an important phenomenon? To what extent do we think actually these uh, foreign institutions matter? And not just in terms of like how they allocate their capital, but how much do they matter actually for the uh, market efficiency and the informational content of prices? So this is the question that we are trying to uh, answer in this uh, paper empirically. So. As I said, this is an empirical project, but of course uh, we are standing uh, on the shoulders of some of the giants, uh, the giants who have actually thought about these questions quite a lot. And there are a couple of uh, reasons to think actually uh, why potentially uh, investors may matter for uh, uh, capital allocation and this uh, real efficiency. So starting with uh, people like Hayek or Tobin, uh, there is quite a lot of actually argumentation put forward that uh, actually investors may be good at screening investments and they may actually produce useful information in a way that actually it can lead to a, a proper allocation of capital uh, to, to financial markets. Alternatively, you can take the Schumpeterian view and think about uh, intermediaries or some kind of important uh, investors as a way in which they are actually able to screen good investments from a bad investment. So to the extent that they can uh, perform this function in an efficient way, you could imagine that can also lead to some kind of uh, efficiency improvement. And finally, you can also think about uh, intermediaries or financial sectors as being efficient as uh, enforcing some kind of a contract. So to the extent that intermediaries can actually be good at enforcing contracts, you could expect that this uh, value maximizing contracts are going to lead to some kind of improvement in efficiency. So all of this is kind of good, but of course, these are uh, models that work somewhat in a stylized uh, environment. We think of them mostly thinking uh, in the absence of frictions. But in reality, of course, there are frictions. So the fact that uh, institutions may be able at uh, actually performing one of these uh, three functions may actually be constrained that there are actually these frictions that limit this activity. So there are a number of frictions one could think about in the context of uh, international uh, investments. A couple of them we list here. So one of them, of course, is the standard asymmetric information problem. So being a foreign investor, you may not know as much about the uh, foreign opportunities as the locals. Separately, you can think about uh, institutional or regulatory frictions. Even though you may know something about investments, you may not be actually allowed to transfer capital across borders, so that may potentially limit your ability to actually affect uh, decisions. And finally, and I think it's kind of important to put into uh, this uh, project, is the scale of the investment. To the extent that actually these flows could be potentially small, it may actually not be economically relevant for any kind of uh, quantitative exercises that uh, we could potentially think about. So partly the objective of this paper was also to assess to what extent these frictions actually matter. If we see that actually financial sector performs this role of uh, 
uh, affecting uh, real efficiency in the economy. Maybe this is one way to think uh, for us about do these frictions actually matter in a, a significant way or in what conditions actually uh, they matter more than uh, in others. So one question which is clearly relevant in the context of this uh, market efficiency discussion is how do we measure efficiency? And uh, the finance literature and economics literature more broadly has thought about this uh, question for quite uh, some time. And we are going to take some basically judgment in terms of what we think are the right uh, measures of efficiency. And not surprisingly, maybe why our discussant is Thomas. So one of the uh, measures that we are going to uh, look at is the measure called uh, price informativeness defined as the predicted variation of cash flows using prices. So to mine his paper with uh, Jenny Bay and Alexis Savov have actually rationalized this uh, measure using the Tobin's Q uh, kind of idea or the Tobin's uh, uh, theory. Separately, Savi and uh, Jaromir Nosal, we have a paper uh, uh, on the information theory, which actually shows that uh, this PI measure that uh, Thomas uh, has proposed is actually consistent with the uh, utility maximization problem of people who are actually learning in financial markets and allow for learning from prices as well. But needless to say, we are going to also explore alternative measures, and I'm going to come back to this. Interestingly enough, it doesn't really matter how you define this efficiency, even though we are going to focus on the first one as the primary measure of uh, price informativeness. OK, so let me talk a little bit about the data. So I was very pleased to hear Moto advertising uh, the various types of data that are these days available to study uh, decisions of uh, institutions. So what we are going to actually do here, we are going to look at the wide kind of panel of the data coming uh, from Faxet. So Faxet is actually a great data set that uh, allows us to uh, look very carefully at the holders of individual equities globally. So we are going to look at the universe of uh, 40 countries at the individual equity level, and we will be able to basically pin down who holds each of these individual equities over the period of uh, more than uh, 15 years, from 1999 to 2016. So for our purpose, what's going to be important is we are going to distinguish between the types of owners. The types of owners we are going to be trying to look at are the domestic versus the foreign ones, just following the idea of this paper. But also, to what extent are these owners actually active versus passive? So we have NBIM here. We can think of them more as being passive investors. But of course, there are also a lot of owners who potentially actually learn. Uh, and they are trying to uh, uncover some kind of uh, private information. So we are going to append this uh, ownership uh, data with uh, various uh, characteristics on these individual uh, holdings that uh, are available. So this is going to come from WorldScope. And in the end, we are going to have a pretty large panel of the data. We are going to have almost 24,000 different companies that are being held by these uh, investors for about uh, 200,000 uh, stock year observations with uh, ownership market and accounting data. So just to give you some uh, pre preliminary stats, uh, the average ownership in the data, total ownership by institutions is going to be about 20%. But it actually varies across developed and uh, emerging markets. So in developed markets, that uh, number is about 25%. In emerging markets, it's about 7%. In terms of the domestic versus foreign, it's still the case that uh, domestic uh, investors actually hold more of the uh, assets on average. And then so is the case that active investors are um, bigger holders than actually uh, passive investors. Of course, uh, there is a lot of uh, cross-sectional variation, both across stocks and uh, across countries, that we will try to exploit in this particular uh, research project. So this is the kind of a graph that I would like you to kind of think a little bit about. It's a graph that shows you where the flows go uh, in terms of the kind of uh, geography of investments. So we are kind of comparing or contrasting uh, two types of uh, scenarios. One is in 2000 and the other one is in 2016. And we kind of single out uh, important regions across which uh, money flows. So we have North America, we have Europe, you have UK, Asia and Japan. And then you have some other countries which are listed uh, below. So what's important is the circles here in this graph are kind of telling you about the importance of foreign investors for each individual regions. So just to start with, you can see that in 2000, the importance of uh, foreign investors was relatively small. You look at US, in the US market that we do so much research about, foreign investors were actually not at all important in 2000. Now they have actually become much more important than they were before. On top of that, what you see actually is that there are certain links which are stronger than others. So for example, the link between uh, North America and Europe is very strong in both directions. On the other hand, for example, Countries like UK don't really trade with countries like uh, South Africa, Brazil, Chile. So, so clearly, the, that uh, kind of bilateral uh, uh, relationship matters as well for what you can potentially see in the data. 
So how is it that we are going to uh, try to analyze this question that we are after? So we're going to start with a very simple approach. Uh, the first approach we're going to take is a simple summary of the data through the portfolio sort. So we are going to construct this measure of uh, price informativeness, which is this predicted variation of uh, uh, earnings using prices for each year and for each country. And we are going to sort countries uh, uh, according to their either total or domestic or foreign ownership. So we are going to have a very standard kind of portfolio sort approach. We're going to sort them into quintile and see whether there is any kind of uh, variation in terms of this price informativeness uh, across uh, different sorts. So this is the table that is supposed to show you how the sorts look like. If you look at about uh, predicted variation for the foreign investors and for the domestic investors. So portfolios are sorted from IO1 to IO5, from the low to high ownership. So just as an example, you can see that for foreign investments, the lowest ownership portfolio has a very tiny ownership value. It's just 20 uh, basis points. But uh, if you look uh, at the highest uh, quintile, you can see that that ownership is actually more than 16%. So clearly, there is quite a lot of cross-sectional dispersion in terms of ownership. What's more interesting is what comes in the next uh, two columns. So what you can see is actually that there is pretty strong monotonic pattern in terms of this price informativeness. Uh, portfolios which are held less by these uh, foreign investors on average have much smaller price informativeness than portfolios that are held more by these uh, uh, investors and uh, the results are very highly uh, statistically significant. One extra point to mention is that uh, there are also stocks which are not held by foreign investors at all. So to some extent the question is to what extent the question is about intensive versus extensive margin. Does it matter that you actually have an owner to begin with? And it turns out that in the context of foreign investors, it actually matters a great deal. If you just go from the portfolio that has zero ownership by foreign investors to a portfolio which has a tiny ownership of foreign investors, the magnitude in terms of the difference of price informativeness is as large as if you go from the first portfolio to the fifth portfolio. So it's a little bit like a Melitz model. Investors actually have to be confident that they can actually enter into something that is profitable for them to actually make that move in the first place. So it's actually a very interesting observation, especially so that if you look at the domestic sorts, this result is not there. So it seems to be the case that the foreign investors particularly are very kind of uh, careful when they make the decision whether they want to enter a particular uh, market or uh, not. So, of course, uh, we want to see how this pattern looks like over time, and it seems to be actually quite stable. So this source that I have shown to you as a summary statistic uh, seems to uh, actually persist uh, over time. So that doesn't seem to be just uh, one particular time period that drives the variation. One could also wonder to what extent actually the foreign investors are kind of a proxy for domestic investors. There could be a lot of collinearity between one and the other. So what we have here is the conditional sort in which we first sort investors by the domestic uh, ownership. And then we uh, kind of do the second sort by the foreign investors. Turns out that these are actually independent sorts. Conditional on domestic uh, uh, ownership, you still have quite a lot of variation in terms of price informativeness with regard to the differences in the foreign ownership. Of course, these are all univariate statistics. So to some extent, uh, standard uh, concerns about omitted variables or anything else driving the results could be uh, applying here as well. So for that reason, we are going to move to the regression uh, framework in which we will try to absorb as much of this variation as possible in the framework. So what we have is we have a pooled regression in which we are trying to predict these uh, future uh, fundamentals, the cash flows or earnings, using the uh, market prices. And then we, we will try to look at the interaction effect with the individual institutional ownership uh, levels. Uh, the benefit of doing this uh, is basically we can include a lot of different controls, time varying, and also we can absorb a lot of fixed effects. So if you worry about some kind of unobserved heterogeneity that is driving the results, time invariant one, the fixed effects are going to uh, help you in this regard. Turns out that if you absorb all of these uh, potential omitted uh, confounders uh, in terms of uh, efficiency, the results seem to be the same. So it doesn't seem to be the case that some kind of characteristics or time invariant uh, potential uh, uh, omitted variables are driving these results. Again, you find that actually uh, can, uh, stocks which are held more by foreign investors are on average actually uh, generating higher price informativeness than those uh, that don't. And it turns out the result is strong for both one-year predictability and the three-year predictability as well. So it doesn't seem to be just a short-lasting uh, effect. It's actually something that uh, affects these uh, uh, companies for a longer time uh, period. So now, of course, 
as someone who has worked with empirical uh, data, there is always uh, a concern how about time varying committed uh, characteristics. So the standard endogeneity problem here applies as well. And even though this is uh, an asset pricing paper, and in asset pricing we usually don't think too much about endogeneity, we behave as corporate uh, guys here. So we decided to actually think carefully about uh, resolving this endogeneity. And what we try to actually do is we are trying to propose an instrument or some kind of framework in which we can think about uh, shocks into foreign ownerships, which are actually only affecting the ownership but not price informativeness at the same time. So, so what is the shock that we are going to look at? We are going to look at the kind of a popular shock that people have used in other contexts, which is basically the index inclusion. So what we are looking at here is the situations in which companies are being added to the MSCI Global Index, which arguably is the most uh, relevant uh, index in terms of the uh, global portfolio allocations. And we will try to see whether companies which are added to this index are actually experiencing different effects in terms of their price informativeness relative to companies which are very similar to the ones which are added but have not been added. So, so we are going to exploit this uh, basically experiment using a standard diff and diff uh, estimation. So we will try to basically compare so-called uh, treatment group, which are the stocks added, to the group of uh, control uh, companies which have not been added, but they are very similar to mimic the counterfactual behavior. So this is uh, basically the first stage of this diff diff. It's trying to show you to what extent the match between the, uh, the treatment and the control is actually quite uh, tight. So what you he see here is a bunch of different characteristics along uh, which we have actually matched the companies. And the kind of takeaway from this table is to say that basically these companies are not very different from each other. So to some extent, the kind of uh, plausible exogenous variation uh, ex ante is uh, satisfied here. So then what we want to see is to what extent we see the differences across the treatment and the control group in the data. So I'm going to show you these results in terms of nice graphs. The graphs are going to actually show you the differences between the treatment and control group in terms of various characteristics. So what you see here in the top left panel is actually the kind of power of the shock. So what you see here is the foreign ownership for treatment versus control. You can see that as a result of the shock, the foreign ownership of the treated stocks is about two percentage points higher than the ownership of the control group. So clearly this shock is a relevant shock, given that the average ownership is about 10%. We are talking about 20% increase in ownership for these stocks. More interesting for us is that you don't see actually any effect on the domestic ownership. So it's clearly a shock to foreign ownership that is uh, happening as a result. And then, of course, the second stage is to what extent we see the effects uh, of that uh, increased ownership in terms of price informativeness. And the right uh, picture it shows you actually that you do see effects which are actually statistically and economically significant. So as a result of an inclusion, companies which are actually added to an index experience higher price informativeness going forward. So, so clearly, that's a, a quite a comforting uh, result. So we confirm these results using the regression uh, frameworks. So I'm going to skip it in the interest of time. And instead, I'm going to show you a couple of other results. So one concern could be that the PI measure that we are using is potentially special, and it may not capture exactly the price informativeness we want. So we have considered three different measures which are alternative and have been used in other contexts. So post earnings announcement drift, price non-synchronicity, and the variance ratios. And turns out the results are actually very consistent. So you have here the same type of pictures for the different measures of price informativeness they all go in the same direction, that basically PAD becomes uh, smaller as a result of an inclusion in the index, price non-synchronicity goes up, and the variance ratio goes down, and all statistically uh, and economically significant. So now the question to some extent is, what's the economic mechanism be behind these results? What are we learning in terms of what's happening with these companies? And to some extent, there are two running hypotheses. One story that one can think about is the Hayek story, which is that basically the presence of these foreign investors makes basically produces more information. There is more information being produced in financial markets, and as a result, the cost of capital, for example, goes down, the liquidity of the assets goes up, and that leads to basically better efficiency of capital. The alternative is that these uh, institutional investors potentially are actually better monitors. So they come to companies and they kind of make a real change. The governance of the company uh, improves, and that's what leads to basically improvement in terms of efficiency. So we will try to distinguish between these two possibilities by looking at a bunch of uh, different uh, tests. So the first one we want to see is to what extent actually these uh, effects of uh, foreign investors 
is the kind of information disclosure story where some market participants are learning something they didn't know vis-a-vis -vis the real efficiency gain that managers of these companies that are actually uh, behind are actually learning something new from the fact that these foreign investors enter the market. So the way we are going to do it is we are going to look at the predictability of earnings instead of using prices, using really investments. So now we want to see to what extent these investment decisions that this management uh, does predicts actually the earnings in the future. And then we're also going to look at the information production in the market by looking at uh, analyst uh, production. Are there actually more, is there more analyst coverage in the markets or not? By looking at cost of capital, is the, the presence of foreign investors actually leading to better risk sharing and potentially reduction in cost of capital? And also by looking at uh, liquidity, so turnover and bid ask spread as a result of this uh, uh, entry. And then we are going to contrast this with uh, some kind of uh, effects on uh, firm governance. So just in the interest of time, what we find is basically that the channel that seems to actually dominate is the information channel. It seems to be the case that these uh, foreign uh, institutional investors, they are actually improving the real efficiency. They are actually improving uh, liquidity in the markets. They are reducing the uh, cost of capital. In fact, the magnitude is about 1% uh, difference in cost of capital. And they are also actually uh, improving the uh, analyst coverage. So analysts are basically covering the stocks as a result of the entry of the foreign investors. What we do not find, however, is that any governance improvement in the data. So it seems to be the case that this is not a monitoring story a la Schumpeter, it's more the information story a la Hayek slash uh, Toby. So these are the results, I'm going to skip them. And one last thing we've done, uh, it was kind of to assess the boundary conditions for the theories we are after. So to the extent that these frictions matter, the ones that I mentioned in the, uh, in the introduction, question is how much do they matter? So we look at a bunch of uh, things to kind of assess the interaction with these uh, frictions. So one thing we look at is activeness of investors. There are two types of investors, someone who comes just to flip the stock uh, without any kind of real effects, but there are guys like NBIM who are very curious and careful about what they are doing when they invest. Turns out that these are the guys who actually matter much more for this price informativeness than the flippers kind of in this market. Second is, does it matter whether you are familiar with the market or not? Is there some kind of knowledge transmission that is happening along the story of asymmetric information? And the answer is yes. If you basically have a closer links with the countries in which you invest, turns out that this is where it actually matters more for the price informativeness. If you have higher expertise when you enter the market, say you come from the US, where, which is a developed market to an emerging market, that's where it matters as well more. And finally, we look at things like capital controls uh, uh, and that it seems to matter as well. If you have uh, countries with uh, stronger capital controls, the effect, of course, is moderated relative to those without. And then it seems to be actually the case that this is a bit like a Schumpeterian story of creative distractions that these institutions matter more, especially in bad times. So this is kind of a one take at the time series variation in the data. So let me conclude. So I think what we want to argue in this paper is that finance matters. And I think I'm happy that Tomai is going to discuss because he's been saying it for some time. So I think the answer empirically is that we do have some evidence that uh, financial institutions can potentially real, uh, lead to real kind of efficiency gains. And we see it through the sector which we consider actually very important, which are uh, foreign uh, institutional investors. We find evidence that is actually consistent with the causal effect of these uh, foreign investors on the price efficiency. And we think that uh, the boundaries of the theories we should be thinking about seem to actually have some kind of bite in the data that we analyze. Thank you. <laughs>